David Corns, and I'm the scenic designer of Warpaint. Warpaint is about the extreme rivalry between Helena Rubinstein and Elizabeth Arden. The challenges to designing Warpaint were pretty specific. So the overall design concept for the show was that we knew we had to define each of the women's aesthetic worlds very specifically, but we knew that we had to kind of bounce back and forth, not only into their worlds, but into these kind of general, more theatrical spaces. So we looked a lot at Art Deco research, a lot of architecture, and a lot of the specific locations that the show takes us to. Eventually, I kind of came up with this round footprint, one that was defined by these sliding black panels. We chose black because we wanted not a mysterious space, but one that was kind of like a womb-like, kind of self-encompassing world that these beautiful elements of high style and color could kind of permeate the space. So we've got these sliding panels that all are internally lit, that are kind of these Art Deco-inspired pieces of architecture. And then the kind of super surround is one of stacks and stacks and stacks and rows and rows and rows of cosmetics. Those cosmetics can represent kind of an emotional barometer. We can light them in all different kinds of ways to really echo the color palette of the scenes, but they also represent in a more abstract way the kind of intellectual representation of what's going on in these, in these women's lives and therefore what they're giving to the world. These huge masses of cosmetics um, that they were kind of pushing out into the world. Elizabeth Arden's world is one that's populated with tons of her marketing tools. She was a master at marketing, a genius at branding. She, of course, you know, created the iconic color pink for her company. We really define her world with floral arrangements, beautiful bows and ribbons and high style packaging, lots of detailed and intricate molding. It's a wonderful world of kind of fluff and fanciful, you know, young women's dreams. And everything that goes on behind the red door is one of like incredible high style and wonderful, lavish detailing. Helena Rubinstein's world is in drastic and stark contrast with the world of Elizabeth Arden. Her world is represented by clean, beautiful, aesthetic, utilitarian lines. She was a world-famous art collector and she was a scientist. A lot of the, the places that we find her are either hard at work in her lab or in spaces where they are created to curate and, and hold art. We use a lot of wood tones, a lot of stainless steel representing her world. One of the really cool specialty art projects that happens in the show is of course Helena Rubinstein is a famous art collector. A challenge that we had in the show was of course to take these original beautiful works of art from these grand masters with Helena Rubinstein's face in them and then sort of laponify them and kind of tweak them, each one starting with a picture of Patty and the original piece of artwork and kind of meshing them together, smush Patty's likeness into these old works of art to give breathe new life into them but to make them much more specific and accurate to the people in the show. One of the great things about designing war paint is that these women's lives were pretty well documented. We have lots of research of what New York City looked like in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Everything from their personal spaces, their apartments, their workspaces, obviously the, the famous Red Door Salon. It was a kind of a feast, and a lot of designing was really about editing out all of the wonderful parts of their lives. The St. Regis is one of those places in the shows where it's really narrative-driven scenes that happen there, both internal monologues and external dialogue. So we knew we needed to put two side-by-side -side meeting places for these women to have their private conversations out in public. And so we really defined the St. Regis with the iconic marquee of the St. Regis Hotel and then high-style luxury booths.
We visit the Cotton Club really quickly in our show um, for one of our big dance numbers. The location really wanted to give a, a more visceral, party, kind of seedy look at what's going on in our characters' lives at that moment. We end up at the Cotton Club and we really represent it with a couple of simple tables and chairs and then that iconic Cotton Club sign. Washington DC is a pivotal narrative point in the show. The women actually sue and then counter sue each other. We simply define it with a flying in, hand carved and hand painted eagle emblem. It's a way to kind of conjure up a courtroom. The Revlon Fire and Ice scene is one that takes place on television. It's when Revson really takes over and begins to sort of usurp the power of Rubenstein and Arden. The scenery is actually representative of scenery that would take place on a television show. So the Revlon sign is a kind of intentionally tacky piece of scenery. And the scenery is really a, a two-way mirror trick that we have because we want to kind of double and then triple and quadruple the women on stage. The final scene at the Women's Association, for me, it wanted to feel like a totally different piece of scenery, and it wanted to feel like a very opulent room backstage at some very fancy location. As far as we know, these women never met in person, and so this was a, a moment to really give great warmth. The scene is so beautifully written by Doug Wright, and I wanted to create a space where these women felt like they were alone, they were protected, and that they could have time to interact. One of the great challenges of the show was to be historically accurate with all of the cosmetic ads. We went through a painful amount of deep, deep dive research into what the actual ads and what the marketing campaigns were for these women and for companies of the time. We tried to stay really loyal to what the aesthetic of those ads were. We basically had to find a way to combine narrative plot point pieces with accurate aesthetic assessments of what actually was happening and kind of mix those things together so when these banners fly in they help propel the story forward and really give you a sense of time and place and what's happening in both the show and also at that time in history. We wanted to really depict gorgeous, beautiful pictures of the 30s, the way they were depicted in print ads. So we took special pieces and features of women's faces and we blew them up to a near grotesque size as if to get into the psychological landscape of the women who were walking the streets being challenged by images pushed out, much like today, towards them in an almost abusive way. Are you living up to these images? A two-dimensional assault on these women kind of hold up a mirror to themselves and say, am I putting my best face forward and how do I look in comparison to these huge, enormous, glamorous women? So there's a number called Necessity is the Mother of Invention and it's when the two women are really challenged by World War II. We took real ads and then we tweaked them a little bit to try and help support the narrative that was happening, but it was really quite fun to use um, makeup and cosmetics almost as weaponry. What I'm most proud of working on Warpaint is the incredible cohesive production. And it's a testament to our writers, our producers, and most especially Michael Greif, our director. Kathy Zuber's costumes are exquisite. Ken Posner's lighting is gorgeous. Dramaturgically, architecturally, textually, and emotionally, we all really are lockstep with each other, and I'm really quite proud of that. It's an honor to be part of this incredible team. I've looked up to these, these members of the team, both the writing team and the design team, for my whole life, and I really feel quite honored to be on a team with them.